In Wadetsu Matenzin Palmo, thank you so very much for joining us for our annual general meeting. Um, thank you, Helen. <laughs> now, you're approaching a very significant birthday, so happy birthday. And often that's thank a time you. to look back and to reflect. And I'd like to take you right back. You heard about Buddhism when you were very young, and that's so unusual as you were in the UK. What was it about the teachings that you heard that appealed so much? Well, I mean, I first um, formally uh, learned about Buddhism when I was 18. And I, I read a book on Buddhism. And immediately I recognized that this was uh, what I had always been. I had just had to know that I was. Um, I especially was very grateful for the fact that Buddhism is non-theistic since I didn't believe in the idea of a creator God, which most religions start with. And also that the Buddha gave a very clear path. He didn't just say, be like this, be like that. He showed how to become like that. And I was very grateful. And what was it that can made you? Hear you... Me? Yes, I can. What was it that made you take that step mm -hmm. of going to India and becoming a nun at such a young age? Well, um, for various uh, causes and conditions, I recognized that my path was through Tibetan Buddhism. And this was uh, in the early 1960s. So it was just after the Tibetans had, um, the refugees started to flood into India and Nepal. And there were very, very few lamas in those days in the West. So I recognized that if I wanted to really practice, I needed to go to India to find my teacher. So for that reason, I left uh, to go to India when I was 20. And then I, I met with my Lama Kamta Rinpoche on my 21st birthday. So then I became a nun about three weeks after that. And were there many other Western nuns at that time? No, no, there weren't. There was one uh, American woman who was sort of a Sakya nun. And through her, I made a connection with the Sakya tradition for which I'm very grateful. But basically, no, there, there was very little happening as far as Western connections with Tibetan Buddhism at that time. The, most of the great lamas had not yet gone to the West. They were and still so, trying to find their, their way around India, right? How did you develop? How did you take in, absorb the teachings? Mm -hmm. How, how did you, from there, how did you, you know, absorb the teachings? Did you have a teacher? Yes, as I say, I met my Lama when I was 21. And then I moved into his community. He had uh, both a monastery and a lay community. And I worked then uh, sort of as his secretary. So I stayed with the community for about six years until they moved to their present site, which is called Tashijong in the Kankwa Valley of Himachal Pradesh. Um, Tenzin Palmer, you're very well known for the time you spent in a cave, uh, mainly because of a book's been written about that. <laughs> <laughs> so how did that happen? What was that decision to go and... Well, I had been with my Lama for, as I say, several years. And then when they moved to their, their uh, permanent site of Tashijong, then my Lama come to Rinpoche, he said to me, now it's time to go and practice. And so he told me to go to the valley, this Himalayan valley of Lahul, Lahul Spiti, and, uh, which is a, a, a traditional Buddhist area. So then meantime, uh, a Lahuli friend had said, why don't you come back to Lahul? 
and stay, I will find you a nice monastery to stay in. So then I, I went back to Lahul and stayed in a monastery, Kutayu Gompa, uh, for about five or six years. Then seeking further solitude, um, eventually I moved into the cave. And that was quite an extraordinary thing to do for a, for a Western woman, to be alone. No. no? It didn't seem extraordinary at all. It just seemed like the logical thing to do. Everybody outside says, oh, how extraordinary. But it wasn't extraordinary. It was, you know, I mean, I had been in India many, many years by this time. It wasn't that I just got off the, the plane from London, right? I had already, by the time I moved into the cave, I'd already been in, in India at least 12 years or more. And so you stayed. So you... it just seemed like nothing. And huh? you stayed year after year for 13 years. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Well, it was a good place to be, you know. I mean, as I say, Lahul itself is a Buddhist area. And um, it said to, in Lahul, the land of the Dakinis. So it has a very special energy there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, since what I wanted was a quiet, safe place to practice, I mean, that was ideal. And since it was ideal, why go anywhere else? Isn't and it? when you look back, uh, Venerable, how important in your whole life, in the, you know, a, a whole of your life was that time in the cave? Oh, well, I, I mean, I'm really very grateful because it was a time when I could completely devote my time to, to practice. And um, there were no, I mean, apart from, you know, having to deal with every day, things like chopping wood and clearing snow there was really no obstacles uh, there was no hindrances to just being one with one's practice and of course every year or two i would go back to see my lama come to rinpoche and uh, check up with him how things were going so it was a good time i mean i look back at that as being probably the most fulfilling and happy time in my life. Wonderful. So after mm. that, uh, you've, uh, I think you were asked to give teachings and eventually after some time, you find yourself really traveling around the world. So it's a very different life. Well, you after, I, I mean, I was basically told to leave India because of visa problems. So then I went to Italy and stayed for several years in Italy, which was a very good time to reconnect with Western culture. And uh, I mean, Italy is the perfect place to be for culture. Mm -hmm. And then I thought it was time to go back to India. So when I came back to India in the early 90s, um, the, the lamas at my monastery in Tashijong said, look, we don't have anything for women, so you should start a nunnery. <clears throat> and I, although I had no idea how to start nunneries, um, I felt, yes, that's true. Uh, if I don't do it, who will? Nobody will. So, um, and I remembered that my, my lama, who had by this time passed away, had said to me, I want you to start a nunnery. So, you know, although I was not Tibetan and, you know, I wasn't a Lama and I wasn't anybody. Nonetheless, you know, slowly, slowly, I began to go move out and start giving Dharma teachings and, and talking about nuns. Because, you know, most people said, oh, yeah, nuns. Well, nobody's ever mentioned nuns. The lamas only talk about their monasteries. Oh, yeah, what about the nuns? And one recognized how much the nuns had been totally overlooked and neglected. And nobody at that time was speaking up for them. So this was, uh, you know, this was something very important to remind people that actually, you know, the monastic sangha, did include nuns who on the whole were still very, very overlooked. And when you opened the nunnery, 
how long before the young aspiring nuns began to come and to train? Well, actually, the nuns, the inspiring nuns came before we got anywhere to put them. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, they, they were to Palmo from Ladakh, our first group of, actually, they were schoolgirls. And they thought they were coming to a nunnery. But when they arrived in Tashijon, they discovered they were the nunnery. <laughs> and um, poor things, you know, they... They were the, the first ones to come. And uh, fortunately, we were able to stay in Tashijon for, um, you know, uh, nearly two years. And meantime, I was looking for land, which we eventually purchased some land, which would belong to Tashijon, which was very fortunate. And uh, began the, this slow process of building up the nunnery. And as nuns heard, heard about it, or girls mostly, schoolgirls heard about it, then they started to um, come to us and get ordained and join the, the nunnery and the study curriculum, which we set up for nuns. So how many nuns would have been trained there? In that time? Well, in the beginning, nuns came and went. Um, for a long time, we had about 21 nuns because we didn't have any room. <clears throat> now we have about 120. Fabulous. And I think you're speaking... From, from the Himalayan areas, you know, all yeah. over Ladakh and to Arunachal Pradesh, all over the that northern part of India, you know, which is often Buddhist. So they're, they're nuns in your tradition? Yes, Vedru Pakati. So um, describe to us what it's like there today. I think you're in your, in the nunnery. Tell us what it's like and and what's happened mm -hmm. during the day. Well, because at the moment the nuns are doing, sorry, my throat's gone. <coughs> um, the, the nuns are uh, all very busy revising because it's exam time. But most of the time they... Uh, in the early morning, they get up to do a Tara Puja for uh, an hour. Then they sit for half an hour in meditation. Then they have breakfast and then clean up, sweep up and clean around the nunnery. Then they start classes. They're studying Buddhist philosophy, to English, and the very small ones are also doing some maths and science. And then they have lunch. Then in the afternoon, they're also revising. A lot of things have to be memorized. I mean, you know, in the Tibetan tradition, a lot of it is memorization. In the evening, then they do uh, a protection pujas and church. And then they spend, after supper, they spend the rest of the evening studying, doing their homework and memorizing. And they go to bed around 11. It sounds then it's a full program, I tell mm -hmm. you. There, <clears throat> but um, now they they are all revising and doing exams. And then in June they have one month holiday in which they can go home if they want to. Um, and then in July and August they do a two month silent retreat during the rainy season. And then the new academic term starts in September. It sounds amazing. We also have a retreat center. We have a retreat center with nuns who some are committed to lifelong retreat and have already finished more than 14 years retreat. And some are just doing a three year retreat. So we are trying to get all the nuns to study, to learn ritual, and also to really embody the teachings in their practice that's what we're trying to do to make them all rounded right it sounds amazing and it's so, so, so very worthwhile it's wonderful to see how they have blossomed you know i mean not just our nunnery but all nunneries mm. really really are flourishing nowadays 
On another uh, tack, you were president of Sakadita International for many years. What are your thoughts on Sakadita, on the organization and its importance? Well, I think, you know, honestly and truthfully, Sakadita is unique because not only is it the one organization which is dedicated to women, run by women, for women, but also it's so totally non-sectarian. And this is very unusual. I mean, whether you're Theravadin, Mahayana or Vajrayana, it really doesn't matter. We're all Buddhayana. And that is very powerfully embodied when we have conferences, you know, as you know, in Sakadita, they have international conferences every two years in a different Asian country. And, you know, the last embodied one was in Australia, of course. Yeah. Um, and the next one will be in Korea. Very soon. In June. Mm. Very soon. I hope you're coming. I am. Are you? Yes, we're <laughs> we're having problems with visas, but we are really hoping that we're all going to turn up. Ah, uh, yes. Um, I... And it's a wonderful opportunity for women from all traditions to come together and appreciate and learn from each other. And it's unlike most most conferences, including most Buddhist conferences, it's joyful. Yeah, it's fun. And there's, you know, it's very warm and loving occasion where everybody meets together. And I mean, as you know, men are just welcome too. It's not a, you know, pro-female, anti-male. I mean, uh, we, we're we hoping to bring along some men with us also. <laughs> um, and monks and, and husbands and everybody. I mean, there's nothing against the men, but it is nonetheless something which is intended for for the women to come together to respect, appreciate, and laugh with each other, and to practice all the different traditions, all of them embodying the Buddha Dharma. It's and very beautiful. Yes, it is, and each other learning about the other traditions and Absolutely. and a very special energy, as as you said. Um, uh, Venerable, when it comes to women and the spiritual life, you know, and, and gender equity, these sorts of things, there's been a lot of obstacles on, along the path. What's your observation about how things have changed or haven't changed, you know, and, and progress made? Well, I think the big change is that nowadays most of the women are educated. And education has definitely been the key, certainly in um, Asian Buddhist countries and, of course, in the West. Hello, Pussycat. <laughs> um, that, um, yeah, I mean, once they become educated, then they start to think, they start to question. And in time, they also start to teach. Most of the teachers at our nunnery are nuns, graduate nuns. And they themselves are now the teachers of the other nuns. And that's how it should be. And so the females finally are getting a voice. Because as we know, almost all the texts, all the books were written by, mostly by monks, by other monks, right? And now finally we're hearing more and more of the female voice. It's not that the male voice is wrong, but it's only one side of the, the situation. How females would approach something might be actually different. And, you know, it, it gives a much fuller picture. So really in the last 20, 30 years, the rise of the feminine has been quite extraordinary how quickly it, it's happened. And as you know, I mean, both in Asia and in, in the West, for whether the teacher is male or female, the audience is almost all female. Everywhere. And so you take the women away, the hall would be empty. You know, there's the lum sitting on his throne, but talking to, you know, two or three guys, mm -hmm. and that's it. 
So how optimistic uh, are you about the future when it comes to Buddhist women and nuns about their growth and, and future development? I'm very optimistic. I think that women have a great role to play. I mean, for, within the Tibetan tradition, of course, the, the, the nuns have everything as far as education is concerned, opportunity for practice and a growing respect from the lay community, the authorities and, and the monks, the one thing they lack is full ordination. Even if you're a nun for 70 years, you're still just a novice. Hmm. And the resistance from the Tibetan side towards full ordination for nuns has been really very interesting because the idea of educating the nuns, once it, once it took hold, the monks were tremendously cooperative. They were the teachers and training the nuns in all the rituals and so forth. They were the teachers. Everything that the nuns know, they own to the monks. The monks have been magnificent. But when it comes to giving them higher ordination as bhikshunis, then there is tremendous resistance. It's like hitting a stone wall. Mm. So that's been very interesting. Why they don't want nuns to be fully ordained as they are fully ordained as monks so that's our next that's our next task and that's... We're going on like this for 30 years but now nuns are fully educated they can they live in really well-run nunneries nowadays they can study the vinaya they can do all the monastic rituals they are totally prepared nowadays there's no excuse not to give them the ordination which the Buddha himself, allowed. I mean, the Buddha himself gave the ordination. So why are the monks resisting? It's the final battle, I suspect. Um, if I, um, Venerable, before I let you go, um, you've been to Australia a number of times. You came out here for our Blue Mountains Conference. Is there anything you'd like to say to us Aussies and to Sakudita Australia? Oh, well, I think you know, it's really important to be together in harmony. I think that the, the one thing that women need to do is to really respect and appreciate other women. I mean, they already give so much to the male authorities, but also they need to give exactly the same level of respect and cooperation also to the, the females and to hold, hold hands together. This is where Sakidita is so important because Sakidita shows the way so clearly how women come together to really appreciate and learn from other women in, in really good spirit and good harmony. And it's very beautiful and inspiring for the men as well as for the women. And that's mm. the way to go to greater harmony, greater support, greater respect and joy and appreciation. You know, that's that's the important thing that we all practice together joyfully. Thank you, Jetsuma. And on behalf of everyone, I'd just like to thank you very much for all you've done for Buddhism and particularly for Buddhist women over so many decades. And may that continue. And we wish you a very happy birthday. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.